Well, as we get started today, I'm going to hope that now that I've turned this thing on, that it will function. Otherwise, I'm going to go spend some time at the computer. But over the course of a summer that is now behind us, Labor Day is gone. Officially, in our minds, school has started and and summer is over. But over the course of the summer, we have been spending our time talking about what? God's creation. And more importantly, more so than God's creation, we have been talking about what God's creation teaches us about God our Creator. Now, I didn't have slides to show down in Whitehall because they're not set up to do that, and so I just gave them a quiz. I asked them back the first part of June, what did we talk about on that first Sabbath that we were talking about creation? And I got a lot of blank stares, so I said, okay, that was a longer ways back, so let's move to the second week and see if we get a little closer, if you remember. And by the time I got up to the third or the fourth or the fifth Sabbath, Uh, I was beginning to understand that, you know what, it's hard to remember what we talked about in sermons several, several weeks ago. You guys have the benefit today of, of the slides. Our first sermon that we talked about, and this doesn't look like it's going to do its thing, so I'm just going to come over here. We talked about the sun. And with the sun, we talked about a verse in particular, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. And when we talk about the sun of righteousness, we are talking about who? Jesus Christ. Are you thankful for Jesus and the healing that he brings to us? Each one of us have benefited from that. The next week we talked about the mountains and the verse that I picked to remind us of that was from Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up. The hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. The thing I would have us to remember as we look back at that particular one is Isaiah, as he went into the presence of God, He says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean, what? Lips. In the very presence of God, he realized that he was unworthy to even be there. And we remember the angels from the throne of God go down to Isaiah and they touch his lips with a live coal. And all of a sudden there is this understanding of the healing that comes through the son of righteousness. And that in Christ Jesus we can freely go into the very presence of God and therefore we say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. The next week we talked about the eagle and the verse that we all can think about and remember from that is those who wait upon the Lord will renew their what? Their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Nothing more majestic than seeing an eagle soaring on the sky. And what we took out of that is what God desires to do in our lives. To make us more than just what we are, but all that we can be in Christ Jesus. From there we move to the flowers. And again, here's your quiz for the day. If you don't know this one, you're not a Montanan and we're going to have to make you leave. Not really. That's the bitter. That's our state flower, just in case. Now you know, so you don't have to leave, right? And Matthew 6, 28 and 29, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. And we talked about what God is wanting to do in our very hearts. That God is wanting to make us into something that has more splendor than even the greatest thing that Solomon could produce in his kingdom. And that splendor is the character of Jesus Christ himself being reproduced where? In our own lives, in our own hearts. And as we went on from there, we came to the trees. Uh, If you're having a hard time remembering the trees, you might remember Gus, the tamarack from Seely Lake, and General Sherman, the 
redwood from California, those massive trees. And we talked specifically that day about three trees. Two trees were introduced in the book of Genesis. We have the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Once we get past Genesis, we never read about one of them ever, ever again. And this is good news because the tree of knowledge and good and evil is never mentioned again in the Bible. But the tree of life comes back again, doesn't it? We see it in the book of Revelation. We see it in the new heavens and the new earth. And there is a promise for you and I today as we put our faith in Jesus Christ that one day we again will eat from what? Tree of life. But in between Eden and heaven, there is this gap that can only be spanned by who we talked about as the real tree of life, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us on the tree or the cross. From there, we moved on to the rain, and we talked about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 10.1 asked for rain from the Lord in the season of the spring, rain from the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain. Anybody been praying for rain lately in our state? We need it desperately, don't we? But more than we should be praying for physical rain, we should really be praying for what? The rain of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, because without it, we are powerless to do and be what God has called us to be. From there, we went to the morning star. This sermon was inspired by Ferna, and it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify about these things for the churches, and Jesus speaking here says, I am the bright and what? Bright and morning star. Jesus is our morning star. And we talked about the fact that in ancient times, there were two stars, one in the evening, one in the morning, that ancients thought were different stars. They came to understand that they were one in the same, Venus, the morning and evening star. And that morning star that is the promise of the day that is to come. Before the sun rises, when that first light is coming over the mountains, no other stars are visible save one, and that is the morning star. And it is the promise of a new day that is coming. If we look at our world today, are you thankful that there is the promise from the morning star that there is a new day that is coming? I'm very thankful for that. But we also know it as the evening star, which after the sun has went behind the mountains and darkness comes, the evening star is a reminder that even in the darkness, which we live in a dark world, there is the light of the morning star, the light of the sun of righteousness that still shines. From there, we moved on to the rainbow and the promise of hope. We remember Noah and the ark, that story we find in Genesis. And God's promise was with the rainbow that I'm going to set my bow in the sky to remind you, right? Well, somebody might need to go back and think, what what did we talk about that day? It was to remind God, remember? The rainbow was to remind God of his promise to us. Now, we understand that God doesn't need to be reminded of anything, but that rainbow represents to us the fact that God will always remember his promise to us, the promise that he will see us through, and we have salvation in him. And the text we used, at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, A throne stood in heaven, and the one seated on the throne, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And we talked about the fact that in Revelation, as we point towards the end of time, this rainbow is still over the throne of God, reminding us of God's faithfulness and his promise. The moon. After the eclipse, we talked about that, and we talked about the moon actually not being so much glorious in the the eclipse time when it's blocking out the light of the sun, but the moon is most glorious when it is reflecting the light of the sun. And we talked about that being the law of God and how God's law without the light of God upon it is empty and there's nothing there, nothing it can do for us. But in the light of who God is, the law becomes a powerful thing in our lives. And we've been studying about that in Galatians throughout the quarter. And then we talked about our pets last week. Now, if you look at that picture, can anybody guess which one of those pets might be Alicia's? Just a wild guess, but I think it might be the one wearing the 4th of July get up there. 
In the text, Titus 3, 4, and 5, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his what? His mercy. The unconditional love and companionship of our pets can remind us of a God who loves us unconditionally and is always there as our forever companion. And Brent, since this isn't working up here, you can just go ahead and shut the projector off and we will go that direction at this point. But there it is. That's 11 weeks of summer. And as quickly as I went through that, that's about how fast summer seemed to go, right? And hopefully that was a reminder to you of some of the things that we talked about over the course of our summer series looking at God's creation. But I want to remind you one more time of the reason that we spent this time. Steps to Christ, page 87, nature speaks to our senses without ceasing. The open heart will be impressed with the love and glory of God as revealed through the works of his hands. The poet and the naturalist may have many things to say about nature, but it is the Christian who enjoys the beauty of the earth with the highest appreciation because in it he recognizes his Father's handiwork, and perceives God's love. Isn't that neat? As Christians today, there's a whole lot of people out there who don't believe in God even, that look at creation and there's some cool things about it that they see, but for you and I today as fellow believers in Christ Jesus, there is something special in what God has created that no one else has, because in it we can see the glory and the character of who? of God the Creator. And that's important for where we go today because we live in a world that although we sometimes recognize creation around us, we live in a world that has far too often forgotten who? The Creator, God Himself. And we are blessed today because it doesn't take a sermon series once a year to remind us of God our Creator God has blessed us each and every week with the gift of one special day. One day that reminds each and every one of us of who? Of our Creator. Yes, it reminds us of creation. Sabbath is a day to go out and enjoy the beauty of creation. But if we look at creation and we don't see the Creator God of creation, we have missed its whole purpose. It is there to show us the love of God. And so today, we are going to start what is going to be the first of two parts. We're going to look at really the same thing from two different angles. We are going to begin looking at the Sabbath. And to do that, I would invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 2. And we want to look at verses 1 to 3. Genesis 2, and we'll start here in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Four words that we are going to explore today. The same four we will look at basically next week, but just from a different angle. But four words we're going to look at today that will hopefully enlighten us about the gift of this Sabbath day that God has given us. Those four words are finished, rested, blessed, and sanctified. The first word is finished. It says here that after six days... On the sixth day, not on the seventh, as some of your Bibles might lead you to believe when you get to verse 2, but on the sixth day, God had done what as far as creation goes? He had finished creation. By the seventh day, all of creation had been what? Completed. Okay? Some translations say on the seventh day, God finished the creating of the world, but he finished in six days, the Lord created the heavens and the earth, But the seventh day he did what? He says he rested. So the work of creation is completed. 
And now on the seventh day, we are reminded here that God finished his work. What does it mean to finish something? Well, we can think of words, completed or whatever. Have you ever been in anybody's house where you're upstairs and everything looks great and they say, let's go look at the basement and you get downstairs and there's really nothing there because the house isn't what? Hasn't been finished. There's something that is left to be done. And when we read the word finished here, we understand that God has completed his work. And when God completes his work, that is something that we can know is very important. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 14. If you want to turn there with me, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 14. That's page 660 in your pew Bible if you're following along there. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Talking about God's work here, it says, I know that everything God does, every work he performs will endure for what? says forever. And then it goes on to say, nothing can be added to it, nor can anything be what? Taken from it. Now, from somebody who has built some things in my time, when I'm done, I often find out that I'm really not done. There's something more that I need to do. Something needs to be added to it. Or sometimes I get it done and realize, wow, that's not going to be very good the way it is, and so I have to take something away from it. What the Bible is telling us is that when God finishes something, it is complete, it is perfect in every way. There's absolutely nothing that is needed to be added to it, nor is there anything that would ever need to be taken away from it. When I read those words, I'm reminded of the very word of God that we read from today. Jesus says that we should never add to it or take from it, not even a jot or a tittle, because it is what? It is perfect as it stands. This is God's finished work. And we read here in the creation account that God, when he finished the work, it was perfect. There was no more that needed to be done. There was nothing more he could do to make it any better. And there was nothing more that as he looked at it, he could say, well, maybe I'll just tweak that a little bit, take that off. None of that needed to happen because it was perfect in every way. Matthew Henry in his commentary says, After the end of the first six days, God ceased from the works of all creation. In miracles he has controlled and overruled nature, but never changed its course, nor repealed, nor added to any of its establishments. The heavens and the earth are finished pieces, and so are all the creatures in them. So perfect is God's work that nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God that began to build showed himself well able to what? To finish. That is going to come into play with what we talk about next week because we read in the Bible that the God who began a good work in me is able to what? To finish that work. And when God finishes it, it is going to be what? Perfect. I'm looking forward to that day. But as we read this in the creation account, we come to find that when God created this earth and he was finished, that was it. It was complete in every way. I want you to stop and think about this for a moment. If you build something and it is complete and there's perfect, there's nothing else that you have to do to it, what is there left to do? Well, the Bible tells us. Because when Jesus had finished the work of creation, he did what? He rested. That's what happens when you build something right the first time. You don't have to go back and add to it or take away from it. You can just step back and do what? You can rest. And that's exactly what the Bible says happened. God finished his work and he rested. Now, lest we be confused about what happened when he rested, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Page 715 in your pew Bible. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. 
Do you not know, have you not heard, the, ever, the Lord is the everlasting God and the creator of the ends of the earth, and he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. So when we read that God rested from the work of creation that he had finished, was it because he was tired or weary? No. And so what is the Bible telling us when it says that God rested? It has often been compared to what an artist might do when they finish painting a picture, perhaps. When they're done with that last stroke and everything is like they like it, they take a step back and they do what? They look at the work that they have finished. And in their hearts, if they have done a good job, they find a satisfaction in what is there. And that's exactly what this word rested means in Genesis is that God took a step back and he looked at what he had created and he saw that it was what? It was good. Matter of fact, it was very good, wasn't it? So good that there was nothing that could be added or taken away and God's heart was filled with a joy and a satisfaction. A matter of fact, listen to these two quotations here. The first one is from Patriarchs and Prophets, which is written in the 1800s. The second quote is going to be from Matthew Henry, which was written in the 1500s. You tell me if you can tell any difference between the two. But notice this is the rest that God experienced after creation here. After the end, this is first from Patriarchs and Prophets. God looked with satisfaction upon the work of his hands. All was perfect and worthy of its divine author. And he rested not as one weary, but as one well pleased with the fruits of his wisdom and goodness and the manifestations of his glory. Hang on to that last phrase. Matthew Henry's commentary, he did not rest as one weary, but as one well pleased with the instances of his own goodness and the manifestations of his own glory. If you set those down, there are about three or four words that are different, but otherwise they are word for word. Now, some people may debate the whys, and I don't care if it was copied or how it happened. Here's the deal. 300 years apart, the Holy Spirit inspired minds to look at God's creation and to look at the rest that God had experienced and came up with words that show us a very beautiful thing about God and His rest. God stepped back and He looked at creation. And in it, it says He saw not only His goodness, but a manifestation of His what? His glory. God's glory is His what? It's His character. As God stepped back and he looked at his creation, he saw in everything he created a reflection and a picture of who? Himself. And that's what made creation so very, very good. Is because when we look at what God created, we can see who? We can see God. And he stepped back and he reflected and he was satisfied. And he found joy in his heart because this gift that he has given all of us is a perfect picture of his very own glory. Our first district was up in Haver and had a church in Fort Belknap before we ever got started in pastoring there. Brianna and I went up to Fort Belknap to do a VBS. Hadn't been in the Fort Belknap church And when I walked in, there was a lot of evidence that there was a whole lot of work that remained to be done. The drywall was on, but it wasn't taped or mudded and the texture wasn't on there. The floors were not carpeted, they were just plywood. And then there was the bathroom. There was no bathroom. We had 30 plus kids at VBS and you're going to have three, three and a half hours with 30 plus kids. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, somewhere over the course of the three plus hours, one of these kids is going to have to go. There's just no way. And so I asked, what what do you do? Well, here's how it works. If you're a girl, 
you'd get into Neoma Abbott's car and you drive a mile and a half down to a service station on the highway and you use their restroom. Okay. What if you're a boy? I was afraid to ask that question. Well, if you're a boy, you see, there's a back door on the church here, and there's a porch, and there's steps that go down the porch, and from there you can go back to the back side of the church, and that's where the boys go to the bathroom. Unless you're a little boy, and when little boys go to the bathroom, you know little boys find it interesting to do it in different ways. So you might not even go to the back of the church. You might think it's cool just to stand on the porch and go. And so after VBS, I talked to them and I said, you know what, we need to do some work here. We need to finish this church. We need to get some bathrooms here. Not a good thing. And so for the course of our first summer up there, we put a whole lot of time, effort, and work into finishing that church. The sheetrock was taped, mud was put on, texture was put on, it was painted. We put carpet on the floor, and best of all, we did put sinks and toilets in two separate bathrooms. Boys and girls could just simply use the church. Cool thing. And then when it was done, we stepped back and we looked. We said, this is good. This is very good. And then winter came. First below zero snap came and our toilets didn't work anymore. We didn't have water anywhere in the church. We found out that when they had brought that what had been a mortuary and put it up on the hill there in Fort Belknap that our pipes coming into the church were about this far under the ground. And they were froze very, very solid. And we had no water. As winter began to go away and spring came, we began to notice that over our doors and windows, our beautiful sheet rocking job began to show cracks that eventually reached all the way up into the heavens. And we found out that when they had set the building down, yes, they had a cement foundation around the exterior of the building, but anywhere else where there was load-bearing walls inside of the church, All they had was a little cement square slab with a 4 by 4 on it holding up the floor. And so in eastern Montana, when the ground gets wet, which it's gumbo-y anyway, it starts to shift and move all over the place. By the end of the spring, I could come in the front door of the church and I had to walk literally downhill, you could feel it, right into the sanctuary. And we had cracks over every single one of our doors. And gone was that feeling of satisfaction, like, wow, that's good. Matter of fact, it actually looked like I had done the sheet rocking. There's a difference when God finishes his work. The difference when God steps back and looks at what he has made. There is no need for anything more, anything to be taken away. It is all perfect and good. And in that, he finds complete satisfaction and joy. He finds rest in his creation. And Genesis tells us because of that, because he finished, because he found perfect rest in a perfect creation, it says he blessed the seventh day. Do we read anywhere in the Bible where God blesses anything? It's not a trick question. Did God bless anybody in the Bible ever? Oh, the Bible's full of blessings all over the place. God blesses individuals. God blesses families. God blesses nations. God blesses people all the time. Have you been blessed this week? You've been blessed today. You woke up. You're alive. That's a blessing, right? You had food in front of you. That's a blessing. You have a church. That's a blessing. Our sky might be a little hazy, but at least it doesn't have a hurricane over it. That's a blessing, right? 
We have so many things to be thankful for. The families that you're sitting with, is that a blessing? That's a blessing from God. There are blessings all around us. We take time to look, we will see them, but too often we don't take time to look and we we miss the fact that God is blessing us every moment of every day. But this is unique. Because God isn't blessing a person. God isn't blessing a family. God isn't blessing a nation. He's blessing a what? A day. Now, I didn't have time to look through the whole Bible and go through this, so I'm going to step out on a limb, and if somebody finds me wrong, that's okay. I won't be too disappointed. But in what I could find in Scripture, with a brief overlook, there's nowhere else in the Bible where as specifically as it happens here in Genesis 2 that God blesses a what? A day. Now, he says on all the other days of creation, it is good, but there is only one day in Scripture that I can see that God blesses. Doesn't bless us, it says on the seventh day. It says he blesses what? The seventh day. So what is the good of blessing a day? Let me read to you a quotation here from Adam Clark's commentary. Speaking of the word blessing here, it says it's frequently used in Scripture in the sense of speaking good of or to a person. That's what God does for us. But here it is spoken well of the Sabbath. In other words, the blessing is on that Sabbath. And the good comes to them who conscientiously observe it. Now, did you understand what it's saying there? God has blessed a day, and the blessing is on that day, but the only way that I can receive that blessing is that if I enter into that rest with who? With God Himself. That is the only way that that blessing is available to me is if I willfully make a choice to go into that special rest that God has on the seventh day Sabbath. Now, is there anybody here who would turn down a blessing if God was offering it to you? If God walked up to you today and said, you know what, there's a very special blessing that I want to give to you, would you say, you know what, God, appreciate the offer, but... You've given me so many blessings, I I don't think I'll take it. Would any of you do that if God were here today offering you a special blessing? We wouldn't even think about doing that. And yet the reality is, is God is telling us here that there is a blessing in this day that we can have, but to get it, we have to make a decision to enter into this rest with who? With God. Christ in the Sabbath, page 20, says this, He blesses man upon every day, but he is blessed only one day, and that is the seventh day. So when man upon whom the blessing of God already rests comes to the seventh day, upon which a blessing rests, there are two blessings, and both of them for man. And so it is possible on the seventh day of the week to enjoy a blessing which cannot be enjoyed upon any other day because it simply is not there. Did you know that there is an added blessing that God is giving you for making the decision to enter into His rest with Him today? It is a blessing you can get on no other day. I don't care what anybody says about, well, it's okay to worship God on any day. Is it okay to worship God on any day? More power to you. We should all be worshiping God on every day. But there's only one day that God has promised this special blessing. Only one day that He has blessed. And it is the seventh day Sabbath. And we can argue back and forth over anything in the world you want to about worship and the days and all of that, but you can't argue with what Scripture says. Scripture makes it very clear that God blessed this day. And if we enter into His rest with Him on this day, there is a blessing we are going to receive from doing that. A blessing that you'll receive in no other way. And here is the promise of the blessing. 
God blessed the seventh day and he made it what? Made it holy. Spent quite a bit of time thinking about this week, this, this week. What is it that makes something holy? Stop and think about that. If you're going to make something holy, what is needed to make it holy? A holy God. I would say that what makes something holy is the presence of who? Of God. We remember Moses on the mountain. He comes across that bush that is burning and God tells him to take off his shoes because he is on what? Holy ground. Was the ground holy because it had a burning bush on it? No, the ground was holy because whose presence was there? God's presence was there. The only way something can be made holy is by God's presence coming to that place. In your Bibles, turn with me here to Exodus chapter 29 and verse 43. Exodus chapter 29 and verse 43. Right after Genesis here, Exodus chapter 29 and verse 43. It's talking about God's sanctuary here. And again, just as a reminder, God says, build me a sanctuary that I may what? Come and dwell with you. Notice what it says here. Verse 39. If I get to it here. Or verse 43, rather. What am I looking at here? Verse 43, chapter or chapter 29. Verse 43, There also I will meet with the Israelites, and the place will be... Now, my Bible says consecrated, but the actual word there is the very same word that we find in Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. It says here that it will be sanctified. There also will I meet with the Israelites, and the place will be sanctified by... My what? My glory. The glory, the presence of God himself makes that place, makes the sanctuary what? A place set apart to be holy. God's presence is holy. And if we look at what's going on here in Genesis chapter 2, this is a very cool thing. God finishes his work. He steps back and he says, this is good. This is very good. He's satisfied with it. And so he blesses the day, and then he goes back and sits on his throne with the Father and says, all right, have at it, world. It's all yours, right? No, God says on the seventh day that this day is holy. I'm not there. I'm coming to be where? With you. My presence is in the Sabbath day. If you're Adam and Eve, you're created as the very last part of creation on day six. In my mind, I like to envision that Adam and Eve were created right before the sun was going down. That their very first moments of life were as they were entering into the Sabbath day. And they were entering into that day with who? with the presence of God, and the presence of God made it a what? A holy day because of God's presence. Adam and Eve, had they finished any of the work? Had they done anything to be satisfied about? Did they need any rest? Nothing that they could step back and even have that rest. And yet God graced it to them this day to be in his presence, to enter into that rest with him. Matthew Henry calls this the commencement of grace in God giving the Sabbath day, the beginning of grace. It is a gift of grace to us. Someone might be tempted to say, well, doesn't God want to be present in our lives every day? Doesn't want God want to be holy in our lives every day? Does he? He does, doesn't he? I want you to follow me here for a moment. My mom is here to visit me for a week or whatever she decides to say. She got here yesterday. 
I'm very thankful that my mom is here because I love her dearly. And being far apart, I don't get to see her as often as I would like. But when she got here yesterday, I was in the midst of a hospital visit, finishing a sermon, preparing to go into the jail, going into the jail, and then coming home. She was tired and went to bed. I was tired and went to bed. And so for the course of her first day with us yesterday, I probably saw her for a total of an hour, hour and a half. Got to talk to her a very little bit. Imagine if she were here for the week and that's all she got. That's all I got. Just a few minutes in between here and there with all the busyness and stuff that's there. And let's just say she's going to be here till oh, next weekend, but on Thursday, I have carved out the whole day to spend with her. The rest of the time, it's just a little bit here, a little bit there. And just because it's a little bit here and a little bit there, I didn't call mom and say, you know what, I'm going to be really busy this week, so come on over, but you're really not going to see me anyway, so stay in a motel for the rest of the week, but on Thursday. No, I would want her there all the time because even if it's an hour, it's better than what? Better than nothing. But come that Thursday when I have taken the time and I have that whole day, is that day going to be a little bit different than the rest of the days? I'm going to be able to enjoy my relationship with my mom on that day better than any other day. And I will tell you that we live in a world that is needing to spend some quality time with God. Yes, God wants to be holy in your life every day, but you know what you and I are doing with God every day? with all the busyness and all the work and the running here and there, even though it might be doing good and wonderful things, we are really not spending quality time with who? With God. We are really not giving God the time that we need to to make our relationship what? Grow and thrive. Your relationship with God needs this day. And I fear that as a people, not the world out there, but as God's people, we are crowding so much of the rest of the week into this day that we are making it hard for God to be holy as he wants to be holy on his Sabbath day in our lives. How many of you got everything done you needed to this week? A couple hands went up. That's a good thing. How many of you brought into the Sabbath day that which was left of the week behind you? How many of you have a busy week next week? Now we're going to have lots of hands. So what that tells me is you guys are in trouble. You didn't get everything done from last week, and you have a busy week ahead of you, so it's going to be really, really busy. How many of you brought into the Sabbath day what you know you're going to have to be doing next week? Maybe you're struggling in your life with something today and you carried that in to today. All of those things. Maybe the Sabbath for us has become coming to church and then we go home and we bring the rest of the world in. All of the things that we would do the rest of the week become the norm that we just do the rest of the Sabbath day. And all of a sudden, a day that God said is going to be holy because it's my day to be present with you becomes just like any other day, just a short little window where we're giving God this amount of time, but the rest of it's mine. And all of a sudden, we can see why a world is far from where it needs to be in its relationship with God. Pretty soon, I can see in my own heart that I'm really not taking advantage of a blessing that God has designed for me to have. A blessing where I can be holy. Even God is holy because the presence of God is here 
in this day. He's created it to be a blessing for you. I will never ever tell you, even if you come and ask, Pastor, what should I do or not do on the Sabbath? As a church, we've been there, and I think it's good that we've left it behind us. That's between you and God. But today I would have you look in your hearts and ask yourself the question, am I really taking advantage of the blessing that God has promised? This day, the seventh day, the Sabbath, has been blessed and it's been made holy by the presence of God. Have you allowed that to happen in your life? It is only by faith that you can enter into this rest with God because you will never finish the work that needs to be done and it will never be complete or perfect. But by faith, we can trust God that He can take care of it. If your week didn't get finished, is God big enough to take care of that? It is. If your week next week is too busy that you have to think about it today, is God big enough to take care of next week? Trust Him. He'll prove it. If your life is falling apart today and it doesn't just feel like God is even there, is God big enough to take care of whatever is happening in your life? He is. The encouragement for us today is to remember the what? Sabbath day. And keep it what? Holy. Very quickly and then we will be done. Can you keep the Sabbath holy? I don't think you can. I don't think I can. We have often read that word in the commandment as if there's something we need to do to keep the Sabbath holy. But that isn't what the word keep means. We just assume it means that we better be good on Sabbath and do all the right things. And that's got us a whole lot of nowhere as far as entering into a rest with Jesus. The word keep means to maintain or preserve. There's actually part of that word that means to fence in so you don't lose it. What is it that makes the Sabbath holy? It is the presence of what? God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Maintain or preserve God's presence where? It's got to be in my life. As I enter into God's rest by faith, I am in His presence. His presence is there for me to maintain or preserve that is to to make this day something where I keep in God's presence. I don't let the world creep back in. I don't go out and seek everything else. I'm allowing God's presence to be maintained and preserved in my life. And when we are willing to enter in to that rest with Jesus Christ, the Sabbath indeed will become a day to remember. As we close today, is the Sabbath a day to remember in your life and in your heart? By God's grace, let us enter into His rest that it may truly be a day to remember.